Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth quarter 2020 Arch Capital Group Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press star, then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. Before the company gets started with its update, management wants to first remind everyone that certain statements in today's press release and discussed on this call may constitute forward-looking statements under the federal securities laws. These statements are based upon management's current assessments and assumptions and are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties. Consequently, actual results may differ materially from those expressed or implied. For more information on the risks and other factors that may affect future performance, investors should review periodic reports that are filed by the company with the SEC from time to time. Additionally, certain statements contained in the call that are not based on historical facts are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. The company intends the forward-looking statements in the call to be subject to the safe harbor created thereby. Management also will make reference to some non-GAAP measures of financial performance. The reconciliation to GAAP and definition of operating income can be found in the company's current report on Form 8K furnished to the SEC yesterday, which contains the company's earnings press release and is available on the company's website. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Mark Grandison and Mr. Francois Morin. Sirs, you may begin. Thank you, Liz. Good morning and welcome to our fourth quarter earnings call. Overall, we are pleased with the current market conditions and the opportunities available to ARCH as we close out 2020 and spring into 2021. One of our fun fundamental principles is that achieving growth and book value per share above the cost of capital over the long run is the best way to create and sustain shareholder value. We believe we delivered on that front in 2020. Our disciplined underwriting and diversified business model enabled ARCH to grow its year-end book value per share by 5.4% over the third quarter and by 14.7% for the last 12 months. We responded to broadly hardening market conditions and, as a result, all three of our segments grew their premium writings in a quarter. In particular, the hardening markets allowed for significant growth within our P and C units, increasing our net premium written for the P and C by 32% for the full year. On the whole, for 2020, we achieved an operating profit of $557 million and grew book value to $30.31 per share. Now, as most of you know, cycle management is core to who we are. Arch leans strongly into improving markets because history has shown that times like these are when superior risk-adjusted returns gradually compound and accelerate book value growth and Arch is positioned to significantly expand as others de-risk, rethink their underwriting strategies, or even retrench. As we look at the opportunities ahead for Arch, I'm reminded of a situation in hockey that is exciting for any fan. In hockey, you get a one-player advantage if the other team takes a penalty. It's called a power play. When that happens, a few things need to be kept in mind as you deploy your specialty power play unit to try and improve the odds of scoring. You need to have a clear five-on-four strategy. You need to be defensively savvy enough to not forget to protect your own zone. And you need to have a sense of urgency because the clock will tick down and you will soon be back to even strength. These are the few moments that make a difference in a hockey game. The advantageous position we find ourselves in is similar to that hockey power play where the odds are in our favor. I'm proud of how our team performed last year during the challenges of 2020. Now, after spending a good portion of the last several years in a defensive position, we're embracing a more offensive mindset. Here's what that looked like in the fourth quarter. Let's begin with our insurance segment. Across our worldwide insurance group, renewal rate changes increased approximately 12%, up 200 bips from the prior quarter's rate changes. Our fourth quarter growth occurred in many lines with DNO, property, energy, and marine all exhibiting strong advances. ENS casualty and our alternative markets business also grew this quarter. We believe that rate momentum in these lines is healthy, and we also see it building in other lines, albeit at a slower pace. 
Increasing margins helped improve our insurance accident year XCAT loss ratio, which decreased by 4.6 percentage points in the fourth quarter. As you may know, the full effects of increased rate levels can take approximately five quarters to become fully reflected in underwriting margins, so today we are earning the, the higher rates from the past year. In addition, our ex- operating expense ratio has benefited from rising production this past year. We are pleased with the continuing progress achieved by our insurance group in the last two years. Turning next to our reinsurance segment, underwriting results were significantly better than the fourth quarter of 2019 despite the impact of $94 million worth of cap losses. While market conditions are not uniformly strong in the reinsurance sector, dislocation from other carriers that are reducing their positions is creating pockets with hardening rates that Arch is well positioned to capitalize on. Reinsurance also benefits from the underlying insurance market rate increases through its clients. For 2020, we grew reinsurance net written premium by 53% with the two main areas of growth being non-cap property and specialty. At the January 2021 renewals, we saw continued rate increases in most areas. However, we agree with the market consensus that property cap pricing moves were more subdued than expected or hoped as capacity for that risk still remains strong. Accordingly, we maintain a cautious approach to this business. Our mortgage segment delivered good returns in both the fourth quarter and for the entire year, despite the economic headwinds. We are confident in the continued earnings strength of this segment, and frankly, the uncertainty we were facing during the early stages of COVID has been largely mitigated. Both premium rates and the credit quality of the new insurance written improved in 2020, and accordingly, the return on capital for our new USMI business is essentially back to 2018 level, which was a strong year. Here's why MI has done well this past year. First, housing markets have remained strong despite the difficult economic conditions. Second, the government forbearance program achieved largely what it was intended to do, which was, which was to provide financial respite to many homeowners. And third, credit criteria in the mortgage sector tightened in 2020, and as you know, credit quality is a critical factor in determining underwriting profitability. On a side note, just yesterday, the FHFA announced that the forbearance forbearance program has been extended an additional three months, which should help further mitigate the risk in our delinquency inventory. The delinquency rate of our portfolio decreased by 50 bips sequentially in the fourth quarter. At year end, roughly two-thirds of our delinquent loans were in the government-sponsored forbearance program. We currently estimate that 89% of delinquent borrowers in our portfolio at year-end have at least 10% equity in their homes. And as we have discussed on prior calls, the amount of equity in a home is the single most important factor in determining MI losses as it plays a significant role in mitigating claim activity. We are cautiously optimistic that delinquencies will continue to cure as vaccines enable the economies to reopen. Importantly, record home purchases in the U.S. in 2020 supported a 5% price appreciation nationwide, while historically low interest rates accelerated housing and refinance demand. This enabled ArchUS to report record NIW of $38 billion in the fourth quarter of 2020, up nearly 60% from the same period in 2019. Our outlook for continued growth in 2021 remains positive. Turning back to the current phase of the PNC cycle, there are three conditions that we believe will persist and help sustain the improved underwriting environment. One, social inflation and reserving problems are now starting to apply pressure for companies that haven't been prudent enough. Two, anemic investment yields require a sharper focus on underwriting profit. And three, a return to a post-COVID world should accelerate economic activity and increase the demand for insurance. Each of these conditions will put pressure on results for the industry. Our conservative approach to reserving over the past several years means that we are well positioned to drive results in PNC going forward since we expect 
our future returns to better reflect current and forward pricing. Finally, with better visibility into the overall economic conditions and with more clarity on the mortgage and PNC prospects, along with our strong capital generation, we see a compelling opportunity to invest in our shares at very attractive returns. Francois will talk to it in a moment. This, re- this, this recent share repurchase is a testament to our capital strategy and designed to enhance shareholder value over the long term. We still have ample resources to deploy towards new growth and feel confident in our team's ability to be creative in order to capitalize on the opportunities before us. This is a time in the game where our cycle management strategy allows us to play offense and deploy capital dynamically to generate above average returns. And now I'll turn the game commentary over to Francois. Thank you, Mark, and good morning to all. We at Arch hope that you are in good health and that 2021 is off to a good start. On to the fourth quarter results. As a reminder, and consistent with prior practice, the following comments are on a core basis which corresponds to Arch's financial results, excluding the other segment, i.e. the operations of Watford Holdings Limited. In our filings, the term consolidated includes Watford. After-tax operating income for the quarter was $230.4 million, which translates to an annualized 7.7% operating return on average common equity and $0.56 cents per share. For the year, our operating return on average common equity stood at 4.8%, while the return on average common equity stood at 11.8%. Book value per share increased to to $30.31 at December 31st, up 5.4% from last quarter and 14.7% from one year ago. Again, an excellent result despite the strong headwinds from catastrophe losses this year, which is a testament to the resilience of our operations and our superior diversification strategy. Losses from 2020 catastrophic events in the quarter Included, including COVID-19, net of reinsurance recoverables and reinstatement premiums, stood at 156.4 million, or 9.4 combined ratio points, compared to 2.2 combined ratio points in the fourth quarter of 2019. The losses impacted both our insurance and reinsurance segments, primarily as a result of a series of natural catastrophes in the quarter, including hurricanes Delta and Zeta, and other smaller events, as well as adjustments to our estimates for events that occurred earlier in 2020. Our best estimate of ultimate losses for COVID-19 for occurrences through December 31 remained essentially unchanged from prior estimates. As of December 31st, the vast majority of our COVID-19 claims are yet to be settled or paid, with approximately two-thirds of the inception to date incurred loss amount recorded as incurred but not reported, IBNR reserves, or as additional case reserves within our insurance and reinsurance segments. As regards the potential impact of COVID-19 on our mortgage segment, as Mark alluded to, the delinquency rate at the end of the quarter was 4.19%, down from 4.69% at September 30th. We are encouraged with a downward trend in delinquency rates over the last few quarters, which continue to come in significantly better than our earlier forecasts. Our latest assessment of the situation assumes a progressively improving economy in 2021, which should bode well for the housing sector and the performance of our book as we move forward. In the insurance segment, net written premium grew 21.6% over the same quarter one year ago, 29.6% if we exclude the impact of the pandemic on our travel, accident, and health unit. The insurance segment's accident quarter combined ratio excluding cats was 93.6%, lower by 800 basis points over the same period one year ago. Approximately 360 basis points of the difference is due to our lower expense ratio, primarily from the growth in the premium base from one year ago, and continued lower levels of travel and entertainment expenses. The lower XCAT accident quarter loss ratio reflects the benefits of rate increases achieved over the last 12 months and changes in our mix of business. 
prior period net loss reserve development net of related adjustments was favorable at 1.2 million. As for our reinsurance operations, we had strong growth of 44.9% in net written premiums on a year-over-year -year basis, which was observed across most of our lines and includes a combination of new business opportunities, rate increases, and the integration of the Barbican reinsurance business. The segment's accident quarter combined ratio excluding CAT stood at 82.1% compared to 92.3% on the same basis one year ago. The year-over-year -year movement is primarily driven by rate change activity over the last 12 months and a more normal level of large attritional losses compared to a year ago. Most of the remaining difference is explained by operating expense ratio improvements, primarily resulting from the growth in earned premium. Favorable prior period net loss reserve development net of related adjustments was 40.5 million or 6.9 combined ratio points compared to 4.9 combined ratio points in the fourth quarter of 2019. The development was mostly in short tail lines. The mortgage industry had a second consecutive record breaking quarter in terms of mortgage originations which allowed, allowed ArchMI to produce 38 billion of NIW in the fourth quarter, a full 15.9% higher than our prior high watermark. With refinance activity leveling off from prior peaks, we, shot, we saw our insurance and force increase by 2.5% across the mortgage segment. The combined ratio was 45.1%, reflecting the lower level of new delinquencies reporting during the quarter. The expense ratio was slightly lower over the same quarter over one year ago, and prior period net loss reserve development was favorable at 8.2 million this quarter, mostly from our second lien runoff portfolios. Improving investor sentiment enabled Arch to issue two Bellamy transactions during the fourth quarter at terms that are getting closer to pre-pandemic levels. You will recall that we discussed our 2020-3 transaction on the last call, an on-the-run deal covering our production from June through August of 2020. Our latest transaction, Bellamy 2020-4, provides additional protection on mortgages we insured in the second half of 2019 and already covered by our 2020-1 Bellamy transaction, by effectively reducing the original retention from 7.5% to 1.85% of the risk in force. At year-end, the Bellamy truck structure has provided approximately $4 billion of aggregate reinsurance coverage. Total investment return for the quarter was positive 246 basis points on a U.S. dollar basis, and we ended the year with our investment portfolio producing a 7.77% total return. While our fixed income portfolio generated an excellent return of 188 bips in the quarter, contributions from our equity and alternative investments were also significant and represented approximately 40% of the total return for the quarter. The duration of our investment portfolio decreased modestly to 3.01 years at year-end, reflecting our ongoing positioning of the portfolio towards shorter-term maturities. The effective tax rate on pre-tax operating income was 6.8% in the quarter, reflecting changes in the full-year estimated tax rate, the geographic mix of our pre-tax income, and a benefit from discrete tax items in the quarter. We currently estimate the full year tax rate to be in the 10 to 12 percent range for 2021. Turning briefly to risk management, our natural cap PML on a net basis decreased slightly to 860 million as of, Jan as of January 1, which, at approximately 7.4 percent of tangible common equity, remains well below our internal limits at the single event 1 in 250 year return level. The decrease in our peak zone PML this quarter is mostly attributable to our ENS property unit within the insurance segment, where we reduced property aggregates in the Florida Tri-County peak zone and made selective additions to our reinsurance purchases. Our balance sheet remains strong and our debt to 
plus preferred leverage ratio stood at 22.1% at EREM, well within a reasonable range. Finally, on the capital front, we repurchased approximately 251,000 shares at an aggregate cost of $8 million in the fourth quarter of 2020. It is worth noting that we have since repurchased an additional 2.6 million shares at an aggregate cost of 83.6 million in the first quarter of 2021 under a Rule 10b-5 plan that we implemented during this quarter's closed window period. Our remaining share purchase authorization currently stands at 833 million. With these introductory comments, we are now prepared to take your questions. Thank you. If you have a question at this time, please press the star, then the one key on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. If you're using a speakerphone, please lift the handset. Your first question comes from Elise Greenspan with Wells Fargo. Hi, thanks. Um, good morning. My good morning. first morning. question um, is on um, related to your returns. Um, Mark, I think in the repaired remarks you uh, associated with mortgage business going back to return on capital levels from 2018, and I'm hoping just for all three businesses, insurance, reinsurance, and mortgage, can you give us a sense of the return profile of the business you're writing today versus, um, you know, what you would have said, um, you know, if I had asked the same question 12 months ago? Yeah, I think the – well, nice to talking to you, Elise. I think the, uh, the, high, the high level of 2018 sort of long-term expected return on EMI was roughly in the mid-teens. So we're you know, going back to that level, which is a really good place for us to be. Uh, on the insurance, I think that we had a bit of a decrease, you know, in, in expected, expected returns, even though the combined ratio did not, um, you know, get that much better for the industry. But right now, you know, if you factor in all the rate changes and everything, we think we're in – in the, the double digit and in insurance return. And I, we think that reinsurance is a little bit in between those two. So we have a really, really uh, different, uh, you, know, uh, you know, risk, uh, risk return, risk adjusted return, you know, profile in our portfolio. It has improved and largely as a result of the price increase, not certainly as a result of the investment return, as you, as you know, Elise. Yeah. And then my second question on, um you know, I think you alluded to this a little bit in your prepared remarks, Mark, when you were mentioning, um, you know, a few, um, you know, a few issues that would help from the pricing momentum side, like persisting from here. A big question, you know, that I get is, you know, does this momentum persist through 2021 and perhaps beyond? And, you know, can you, obviously, different dynamics in the insurance and reinsurance PNC markets, but, yep. you know, can you just give us a sense based off of what you know today do you think that the pricing momentum can persist through 2021 in insurance and also um, reinsurance? We expect it to be the case, uh, at least because, uh, because of all the factors I mentioned, you know, the social inflation, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of loss ratio picks for years, specifically 2015 through 19, as we all know. Um, you know, it sort of makes for correcting uh, some of the you know, ongoing pricing, so that's definitely sustainable. We do not have as much uh, you know, protection from the investment returns, so that really puts a lot of pressure on the returns for, for the industry. Uh, and uncertainty and, and, and lack of, if you will, coverage. And we also had, you know, a fair amount of cat losses in, in, in the last, you know, three or four years. So there's a lot going on, a lot more risk out there. So I think overall, collectively as an industry, uh, you know, we all collectively think and know and believe that we need to get better rate and better pricing because, you know, the risk is, is not being rewarded accordingly. As in every hardening market, you know, it, you know, the length is like how long is the piece of string, but I think that the hardening market does not, you know, only last four or five quarters. I think if you have this initial stages of the initial reaction of rate increases, then you get momentum building in the underwriter's mentality. The brokers are sort of, you know, accepting it as being sort of a, of a new way to deal and do the business. And eventually that builds upon itself. Um, I would fully expect to be lasting to 2021 and into 2022. This is what we believe at this point in time. Okay, and one last numbers question. You guys mentioned the PML going up a little bit, um, but in terms of your cat load, I think in the past, Arch used to talk to like a 40 million of quarterly cats. Obviously, we've seen growth um, in cat reinsurance and you know in other property-related lines, like you mentioned. Um, 
How should we think about the cat load um, from here? Yeah, I mean, no question that we've uh, we've written a lot more property premium in the last, you know, in the last, I want to say, four to six quarters. We've really ramped up our, our property exposures. I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, in different areas, as you know, with different lines of business, uh, U.S., international, et cetera. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the cat load, I think, on a quarterly basis has definitely gone up from what we were, you know, in the old days thinking about like $40 million a quarter. Uh, it's you know it's still evolving, but I would say it's probably more in the, in the sixty to seventy million dollar range right now. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks for the color. Thanks, Lee. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Mike Zaremski with Credit Suisse. Hey, um, good morning. Follow up um, on um, mortgage insurance and um, Elisa's. Uh, question um, you know if, if you're talking about kind of um, you're encouraged about the downward delinquency rates and uh, assuming the economy progressively improves and you I think you mentioned mortgage biz can throw off returns somewhere to 2018 levels so are you saying kind of directionally we should be thinking about um, a combined ratio that continues to, to, to move uh, uh, south it kind of towards 2018 levels, or have the, have the capital um, yeah. assumptions changed since then? You know, Mike, in terms of combined ratio, the capital is a different story because it's a bit of a lagging indicator based on the delinquencies we have. But if you look at the combined ratio, yeah, we think that, you know, we're tending to go towards more, uh, you know, so the run rate that we had in 2018. I would just caveat that there was some prior development, you know, favorable development in 2018, so I would probably adjust for that. But certainly the, you know, the long-term range of 35 to 45 is not something that is out of the realm of you know, real possibility if you look at 2018. And I think depending on what, how the economy recovers, you know, that could be in the lower end of that. And if a couple things still develop uh, you know, in a different direction, it might be a bit on the, lower, on the higher side. But you're right. It should be getting closer to where we were in 2018 in terms of combined ratio. Okay. That, that's helpful. Um, switching gears to the um, – Ins the non-MI insurance segments, you know, you've been, the expense ratio has been um, better than expected for a number of quarters. I know you guys have called out some some items. Maybe you can kind of remind us and talk to kind of what's, what you think is kind of cyclical um, and, you know, and what's kind of structural in, in terms of the expense ratio improvements. Yeah, I think, I think this is more structural, I would say, Mike, because right now you have to factor in the fact that our platform grew uh, you know, on both sides, both in the sense of growing the top line for in our organic, you know, lines of business, and we also had the acquisition in London and really pushed to be much more relevant, much more bigger in London. So our international operations also gained scale. So if you lo now look at the overall uh, structure or the way that the company is laid out in terms of top line and the way that the expenses is, is constructed between, uh, between the units, I think it's much more of a structural uh, change. Uh, you know, I would say that it's probably 50-50, uh, but the growth is certainly something that's really important uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, helping that, that growth. So that could also get presumably a bit better over time, but I would also tell you that the growth in our operating expense on the insurance side has lagged the growth in our top line, which is what we should expect, right, because a lot of the increase is not more work, even though we are writing more business. A lot of the increase in premium is just rate you know, in and of itself. So I think that the, the company is, is flexing itself in terms of uh, top line growth and expense, you know, uh, deployment very, very nicely. So a bit more structural than I would have told you probably two years ago. Thank you. Our next question comes from Yaron Kinar with Goldman Sachs. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess my, my first question, um, revolves around MI. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts around the potential changes to FHA fees and its potential and for their potential impact on the MI business? Yeah, I can listen, it's still early. I don't know, it's a new administration change. There's a couple of things going on all over the place. Washington, I'm sure they're very busy right now trying to, you know, changing things. Um, you know, what we, we hear the same things that you guys hear about the 25 bips, you know, potential uh, price cut that FHA could, could put in there. 
And as a reminder for everyone, if you take a step back, the FHA, you know, was a large market share uh, provider of MI insurance, you know, in the years where the PMI, the private mortgage insurers, were not in that great of a shape. And frankly, that was needed to, to uh, fill the gap and fill the void, if you will, of, of the need for the, of the homeowners and the, the mortgage providers. So this has changed. I think that the FHA also ultimate role and core role is to provide uh, you know, mortgage insurance for the one, th- those that are probably could be perceived as a bit more risky uh, for the private, private sector. And so we've done the analysis, which means that if you look at our portfolio we're, we're you know, high FICO, uh, very high quality. Uh, most of our, the borrowers that we have on our portfolio do not really need to consider FHA. So from our perspective, we'll react obviously to whatever is out there, but uh, we've, we believe that this, if it comes to fruition, that 25 bips uh, rate cut in FHA will help the lower uh, FICO and higher LTV uh, you know, borrower, which you know, is really not the ones affecting and the, the ones that we're you know, currently having success with because our pricing is actually better if you compare our pricing versus the FHA in that sector, our pricing is better and our execution is, is cheaper for the, for the borrower. So we're not losing sleep over that. Got it. That, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and, and then my, my second question, um, you, know, you previously talked, I think, about shifting capital deployment from MI more into PNC. Uh, I think last call you used more of a basketball analogy that was easier for me to follow than, than hockey, <laughs> but thank you for explaining. <laughs> um, but I, I, I guess as market conditions kind of – your views on market conditions change a bit, it um, seems like reinsurance may be a little less exciting than, than maybe a quarter or two the, – the outlook was a quarter or two ago, and MI may be a little better than the outlook was a quarter or two ago. Does your uh, appetite for capital deployment between the three segments, has that shifted or will it shift into 2021? I wouldn't say it shifts in, in, in any major way. I think we see all three three segments with you know very good opportunities in front of them, um, and and maybe you know we'd argue some were overdue, especially on the PNC side. So we're we're bullish there. Mortgage has always been you know uh, in basketball you know our six or seven foot six guy down low and and ready for dunks, and that hasn't really changed in our view. So. Yeah, I mean, we got certainly have more visibility into what the ultimate or what the, the current market conditions are, in, especially in mortgage, given what we you know the, the second half of the year how things progressed, and that's that's good. I mean, that's something that we uh, take you know you know you know, I think it works in our favor. So, uh, but in a big you know uh, big picture, we don't see major changes in how we deploy capital. And yeah, and one thing I would mention to you that I, it's, it's always. Uh, it's, it's hard for people not to see us being a Bermuda, as being a property cat writer on the reinsurance side, but I would argue that, yes, on the property cat side, it's not as good, and you've heard it from other people, and we certainly agree with that, but, you know, we're still growing in areas that are non-property cat, right, exposed, so we're seeing a lot of uh, other lines, to be honest, between you and I that are actually better now, or the prospects for 21 better than they were, you know, in, in 2020. It's just that, uh, it, you know, we're not you know, growing necessarily in the one that I get the better headline, if you will, uh, for, from your perspective. But by and large, I think that our prospects are very, very good on, on the reinsurance side, very much so. Got it. Thank you. And, and thanks for translating hockey into basketball for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. Our next question comes from Jimmy Buller with J.P. Morgan. Hi, good morning. I had a couple of questions. Uh, first, if you could just talk about your sort of comfort level with your BI reserves, given um, that the developments in the U.S. seem to be favoring the industry for the most part. So do you feel like you're overly con- uh, conservative on your reserves? And, and obviously, internationally, things haven't gone as well. And then I had a thought, uh, another one as well. Yeah, uh, I, I think we're, or, or we, we never would uh, say that we're overly conservative. We want to be prudent and, and, and conservative for sure in how we set reserves. I'd say starting again with international, which maybe has gotten a bit more a headlight, um, uh, you know, made the headlines a bit more. Um, you know, our position hasn't changed in the UK. Again, the book we have is a small regional book, uh, well, well protected by reinsurance protection. So we feel that the reserves we have there uh, even after the call it slightly adverse rulings from the the courts in the UK were um, aren't going to affect uh, our bottom line, so we're no, no changes from our point of view there. 
Um, and in the U.S., uh, for the most part, as you said, you know, all the, the rulings have kind of been in favor of, uh, in the, of the industry. A uh, couple of places where there's maybe some, some, some that didn't go as expected, but on those, I, you know, our view is that uh, the policies that were being challenged were manuscript policies, so not the standard ISO form that we typically use uh, without you know, necessarily the uh, strong wording around uh, virus exclusions and property damage to, to trigger coverage. So on both those fronts, we got, as we said before, vast majority of our policies, well north of 90% across the book that has these, uh, both of these, call it, uh, protections. So we're, we're very confident that our results, our reserves at this point, uh, won't develop adversely and we're, you know, we will keep looking at it, but it's, uh, we're in a good spot. And I think you said about two thirds or three fourths were IBNR um, as of last quarter. What, what's that number now? Two thirds. It, it went down a little bit. So we six, roughly from seventy-five to sixty-seven. Roughly, I mean, it hasn't changed much, and it's uh, so. And, and some of that is is around, you know, as you can ex expect, mostly on the reinsurance side, right? Where uh, we we you know a lot of our reserves are you know are still on the reinsurance side with. Uh, significant IBNR and ACRs on, on that book. And then on buybacks, you did a decent amount in, uh, so you've done a, a lot of this year, so what's driving your um, sort of actions there? Is it the stock price? Is it, I'm assuming there's decent opportunity to deploy capital in your businesses given pricing, but what's, what drove the big uh, uptick in buybacks versus what you've done the last few quarters? Yeah, it's certainly more visibility, right? I think that, you know, we said that from the start. We, uh, you know, at the end of the first quarter last year, we said, listen, we're going to take a little bit of a pause because we, we, we need to know where things are going to, how things are going to play out. And, and, you know, mortgage being a, a major driver in that performance, uh, you've seen the results. So we were a lot more confident where, where the economy is going. Vaccines are rolling out. So there's a lot of things that, yes, will take some time, but, you know, as we look forward, I think that gives us a lot more comfort that uh, the worst is, you know, behind us, and uh, that gives us a more more clarity on on how do we deploy capital. We're still, and in, in our mind, we're we're fully capable of doing both. We want to grow the book and also buy back shares. There's no reason why they they have to be exclusive. We think uh, our growth is still very strong. We expect to keep growing in 21 and across the book, but. Uh, we also see uh, a good, uh, you know, opportunity at the current level pricing levels for the stock to uh, to buy back at this point. Thank you. You're welcome. So before we go to the next one, I think I have to stop the broadcast. I think I believe we have uh, breaking news. Uh, this just hit the wire, so I think we have to go to Francois for some uh, commentary that you want to share with us. Francois, yeah, and that's long overdue, Mark, but just wanted to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to fill everybody on the call on the latest developments with our proposed acquisition of a 29.5% ownership stake in COFAS, the Global Trade Credit Insurer. To confirm what some of you may have seen across the business wire over the last few minutes, uh, if they weren't paying attention to what we were saying, right. but... Um, we closed on this transaction with Natixis earlier today. Um, and the reason for the timing is uh, that we had to wait for their uh, markets to close, which they have. So the consideration paid by Arch was 9.95 euros per share for an aggregate 453 million euros uh, in aggregate, including related fees. In connection with their minority stake in the company, Arch now has four representatives on the COFAS board of directors. As we stated before, we continue to view this transaction as an investment, and we currently do not intend to increase our ownership position in COFAS. From a financial reporting perspective, you should all expect us to include our proportionate share of COFAS's results in our financials starting next quarter. We intend to report the contribution in a new separate line titled Equity Method Earnings from Operating Affiliates, which will be included in our definition of operating earnings. This line will also include the contributions from other non-consolidated affiliates, such as Premia Holdings. So that's the breaking news, Mark. Thank you, Paul, for the update. And Liz, if we can go back to Mr. Dunn, who is waiting in line, I believe. Jeff Dunn with Dowling & Partners. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, a couple questions on MI. First of all, 
Um, what was the incidence assumption for the current period provision as well as the average severity factor this quarter? Yeah, so 9.4% for the new NODs in the quarter, um, and the average reserve for DQ was a little bit over 5,000, pretty much in line with the third quarter, Jeff, because the, the risks that came in were a little bit less, uh, less coverage in this, in this quarter. So that would explain the average being a bit lower or a bit more in line. Okay, and so as you think about 20 or the, the first part of 21, there, are, to my knowledge, the, they extended the forbearance period yep. up to 15 months, but you can't enter new forbearance activity. So what did your provision for non-forbearance loans or your incidence assumption for non-forbearance loans look like in the fourth quarter? Yeah, I don't think we, we did not. The way we reserved it, we sort of tried to make an overall all-encompassing assessment and put that in that number. So I think that that's what you might have said, might have thought in the past that our number could have been a bit higher. So we think that we have enough in the reserving in totality based on the, on the factors we've used. Okay, but with forbearance options going away, fair to assume that that instance assumption will probably climb in the first oh, well, half? Yeah, Jeff, we might, right? We'll have to evaluate when we get there. I think you're right. I mean, so you have to till February 28th to actually uh, ask for this for be under the forbearance program, so we'll see how that develops. We have a surge in a couple of weeks of uh, people asking for forbearance. That might help, uh, again, more. Uh, we'll have to readjust, Jeff, as we see at the end of the quarter. We'll have another month of non-forbearance, uh, you know, effective new, not new forbearance, so we'll have to reevaluate when we get there. Okay. And then within the P&L, uh, can you talk a little bit about what drove the pretty notable sequential drop in earned premium? as well as some of the movement on both the expense lines? Was there any reallocation on the expense stuff? Specific to any segment or, in, I mean, uh, all, all, in MI, right? <laughs> all in MI, right, Jeff? All in MI? The I, premium line was down 15 million sequentially, and then you had some just, looks like a little bit of abnormal movement, particularly in the uh, acquisition expense line. Um, relative to the third quarter, but just a little bit more volatility than we would tend to see. Yeah, the first one I'd say uh, A was a uh, call it a, a an accounting catch up or true up on our Australian business how we uh, on the written side. Um, so that I'd say that's more of a, a one off kind of blip that we uh, we, we uh, you know we had to adjust for, um, or was actually was present last quarter and wasn't this quarter. So that's how that that's how we the um, you know that that explains that movement on the um on the acquisition um there's um you know we we entered into a quota share agreement starting last uh at the middle of the year covering our USMI book and that actually you know gives us uh you know a benefit in, in terms of the acquisition it's a reduction to to the acquisition during the seating commission so that that is what is starting to flow through in our numbers all right, great. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Phil Stefano with Deutsche Bank. Yeah, thanks. I, just continuing the MI questions, I guess. So, so you had mentioned that roughly two-thirds of the defaults are in forbearance. I, I was hoping you could give us a flavor for how many people are nearing the end, uh, end of their forbearance window and, and how many people in forbearance does it feel like are, are current on their mortgages? Yeah, so... Yeah, the numbers we report to you are those are in forbearance and then delin have, have skipped two payments at least. So we have a few more, as you could appreciate, that are in, for in forbearance and are still current. Uh, the data is coming in very, very uh, haphazardly. So it's very, I wish I, you know, we, we are constantly asking and prodding for that kind of information. I think that most of the forbearance that are still, uh, you know, still there are, uh, lower in the year. Most of the forbearance that were declared early in April, May, June, uh, the vast majority of them have cured by now. So it seems to be the pattern of getting to forbearance and sort of staying in there for five, four or five months, and then eventually things get back to normalcy. Uh, so that's what we would expect it to, to be the case going forward. So I don't have a definite answer for you yet. No, no, no. That's I, I, so. The, I think the one question that we're, we're we're trying to get to, and I get a lot of questions about, is you you had mentioned eighty nine percent of the delinquents have at least ten percent in equity in the home. 
Yeah. Um, and, and you had talked about visibility allowing you to repurchase shares. I mean, at what point do we get visibility that maybe the MI reserves are a little more re- redundant and we can start to see a release there? I mean, how, how do we think about what you're looking for in the visibility to, 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 um, to un, uh, you know, adjust that? So from your lips to God's ear, I hope you're right that it's, uh, it's going to be redundant. We'll see. Only time will tell for us. I think the, the way we look at reserve, uh, Phil, is very simple. It's just we have to wait till we get the data that we feel confident, uh, you know, that we're going to get there. And as you know, you've seen us do the reserving on MI and PNC for a long time. You know, you tell me when the forbearance program is done and when the unemployment rate goes down to three or four and the economy picks up again, then I'll have a better sense for, for what it is. So... Uh, we hope, but all, having said all this, I hope that by the summer, after the vaccines have been rolled out, that we'll have much, much, much better vo- uh, visibility as to what, if any, uh, the reserve needs to be released or is not necessary to pay claims. Understood. Okay. And switching gears uh, on, on the reinsurance business, I, I appreciate the remarks you made in response to an earlier question. I, is there any way you can? F- help frame for us what the opportunity is for, for premium volume. I don't, so maybe it's, you know, how did one ones go versus last year, or how should we thinking about the, the growth potential in 2021? I think the growth in 2021 should be more in line, at least, with what we've seen last year. I think the opportunities on the reinsurance side, oh, you have an echo here. I think the, the reinsurance opportunities are still very, very solid, very strong. Um, they're not necessarily, as I mentioned earlier, in the you know, traditional property cat arena, but we're definitely, definitely looking at a lot of transactions, and a lot of them will have to do with what you would expect a reinsurance company to be providing, which is capital, uh, as we get into you know harder market, right? A lot of people are, you know, some of our clients are looking for capital, or at least looking for for validation of their plan going forward, and want to make sure that they uh, they re underwrite and re uh, repurpose their book of business that we're there to help them. And we're able, in that case, to, to help them get through that transition period. So the, the opportunity in reinsurance is, was great last year, and I think it's, it's actually very, very good. Again, as we go this year, one interesting fact for everyone, that one of the key leading indicators to us, to me at least personally, based on my history, as to what is a leading indicator of the treaty reinsurance uh, uh, conditions that are the, prop, the, the facultative uh, industry is still really, really strong, and it's typically... Uh, you typically have a, a, you know, a hard market or a hardening market for as long as the fact market uh, goes. Uh, you'll have a treaty market you know, staying strong you know, well beyond that, a year to two years beyond that. So we expect that to, uh, to be, yet again, a strong leading indicator. And we, our facultative team is telling us that it's a really, really good market for them at this point in time, which is encouraging. Great. Thank you. Sure. Our next question comes from Meyer Shields with KBW. Um, great, thanks. So, two questions on the PNC side. First, uh, you know, Arch's uh, confidence in the pricing cycle has clearly borne itself out. But is it safe to say that um, maybe this is as good as it gets on the property cat side because there is this level of, of capital available? So, um, so that cycle won't play out along historical lines. Yeah, all I will tell you, Meyer, is my experience. We did a lot of property cat writing in 0102. And if you remember at Arch, we were not, you know, heavily focused on property cat Excel, Excel at the time. We were more on the uh, liability side, and, and the market was going down in 04, in, well into 05. And we thought, we'd, we thought we had seen the last of the hard market for a little while, and Katrina Rita and Wilmer happened and changed the whole thing. So my question to you, my answer to you is I don't know. I don't know is the, the short answer. I think that there's clearly – uh, a lot of capital that, again, found its way over the last four or five years. And once capital found its way into a niche, it gets sticky, right? It wants to stay there for a while and will sort of justify itself for a little while longer, perhaps, than it should. Um, but I think we're always on, hopefully it doesn't happen, but we're, we could be one major event away from changing the perception of risk in that area. And that, I think, will, in, will mean actually probably a much harder market than you would expect, Meyer, because the volatility and the the, the knee-jerk reaction, it would be like an elastic right when this happens. I think you'll have a, you may have a massive exit of capital out of the door, and that might create more opportunities for us. I'm not saying it will happen, Meyer, but I could see a scenario where your uh, premise does, that, does not actually hold true. So there's always a, there's always a chance. 
Okay, no, I just wanted to understand what you were thinking about sure. it. Um, yeah. Second, you talked, I think, on the insurance segment about market dislocation. Uh, and I think maybe the sense is out there that that has been a major factor or was a major factor in 2020, but now most companies are kind of settling down uh, and are comfortable with their books of business. Um, are you still seeing, like, today uh, that level of market dislocation? Dislocation is, you're right, there's some, some re realignment. There's a couple of people, you know, uh, going back to the market. It, this is truly happening, but it's not across the board. And there are still, we believe, um, bad news that needs to come find their way through the system. And that might make somewhat of a difference as we go forward. Um, but again, if you, if you had a 20% rate increase on one transaction on the insurance side this year, uh, and you had, this is on top of a 10% last year, if you get rate on rate on rate perhaps three times, it's not a bad place to be. And plus, I think what we hear, Meyer, for what it's worth, and it's actually not insignificant, we're hearing terms and conditions finally changing and moving in the right direction. So rates will move first, and terms and conditions sort of follow right behind, and we're hearing that this is what's happening in marketplace. So even though we may not have a headline growing as high in terms of rate change as much as it was over the last two or three years, I think the underlying conditions in the policies you know, could actually you know, help improve it way beyond the number that we see on the, uh, as a headline number. Okay, understood. Thank you so much. Welcome. Our next question comes from Brian Meredith with UBS. Hey, thanks. A couple of them for you here. Um, the first one, um, Mark Price, I wonder if you could just confirm, it, it used to be that your determination on whether you buy back your stock or not is that if you could actually recoup the premium you paid relative to book value over a three-year period. Is that still the case? And if it is, does that basically mean that you could, you'll continue to be pretty aggressive with your share buyback given where your stock's trading right now? Yeah, I think that that rule of thumb still is still in place. I mean, obviously, it's not a black and white. I mean, there's always uh, you know factors we consider around deploying, whether there's business opportunities and et cetera. But yeah, we still think in those terms of the buyback, uh, the premium we pay, and you know, we want to earn it back over you know uh, no more than three years. Um, you know, and you're right. I mean, I think the fact that you know the price, the, the stock price is not as uh, you know is, is below that. That level, uh, you know, suggests that maybe we'll be uh, we'll be out there buying more stock as we go through the year. Um, we'll you know we'll we'll assess you know obviously you know as we you know every day every quarter we will look at what's in front of us. But uh, for the time being, I think we're um, you know certainly something we're considering, and we probably will do more of. Gotcha. And then just on that on that topic, so just maybe a little bit on uses of capital or cash kind of here going forward the next 12 months. It sounds like you've got 453 million that's going out here. We've got Watford that I think is yet to get to close. Um, is that at all going to be constraining to your ability to actually uh, buy back stock, given you're also f capital you need to fund your growth in your business? And particularly well, what Mark just said on the reinsurance business is going to be very capital kind of generated type transactions. No, because we, I mean, we raised a billion dollars of capital, as you know, last summer. It, it, we didn't deploy it fully until, you know, right, it was all part of that kind of 1-1, one, one, uh, looking ahead as, as to what the 1-1s one, would do. We know these transactions were, you know, uh, on the horizon. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of faith in our ability to generate earnings moving forward on our own. I mean, by, I mean so self-funding the growth. I think is something that is is part of the plan, and um, you know we don't really have you know a whole lot of constraints other than that. And Brian, you know both these acquisitions that you mentioned will actually be accretive and you know grow book value for us, so they're capital positive for us. Gotcha, that makes sense. And then last question, I just, just now that it's closed, Kofes, maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, color and what the title insurance market looks like, uh, you know, in Europe, kind of return profile. Um, what should we, we we expect here? You know, it's been about, what, 20 minutes that we announced this, so we're going to have to give me a couple more quarters. <laughs> but you've done you your due mind. diligence, haven't you? <laughs> well, no, we have it, but listen, we've got we to think it through. Well, we got, we, we have going to have uh, directors on there that are going to be working very close and hand-in-hand in hand with COFAS. We're very excited, as you know, Brian. Uh, I think there's more than meets the eye in this one. I think strategically uh, it's going to be a very, very valuable thing for us, uh, way beyond just the, you know, the initial investment. I think it's a... It's a formidable, you know, uh, established, uh, you know, company across so many countries with so many client contacts. We're we're really excited about that. 
Great. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I'm not showing any further questions. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Mark Grandison for closing remarks. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a next, uh, have a nice, you know, several months ahead for the ahead for the f first quarter returns. It's an exciting time to be at Arch, and we're very pleased that you are there with us to enjoy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's conference. This concludes the program. You may all disconnect. <laughs>